The Sherman Players presents The Twelve Days of Christmas Carol, an audio production of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, starring Matt Austin, Dean Alexander, Jody Bayer, Noel Desiato, Michael Wright, and Desiree Kelly. Part 5, read by Noel Desiato. The ghost of Christmas past continued to show Scrooge what had gone before. His love for his sister Fan, his old apprentice Fezziwig, and his first and only love, Belle. His former self turned down the lamps as he gave utterance to the wish, and Scrooge and the ghost again stood side by side in the open air. My time grows short, observed the spirit. Quick! This was not addressed to Scrooge, or to any one whom he could see, but it produced an immediate effect, for again Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man in his prime of life. His face had not the harsh and rigid lines of later years, but it had begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. There was an eager, greedy, restless motion in his eyes, which showed the passion that had taken root and where the shadow of the growing tree would fall. He was not alone, but he sat by the side of a very fair young girl in a morning dress, whose eyes there were tears, which sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas past. It matters little, she said softly. To you, very little. Another idol has displaced me. And if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you, he rejoined. A golden one. This is an even-handed dealing of the world, he said. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty, and there is nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much, she answered gently. All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you, have I not? What then, he retorted. Even if I have grown much wiser, what then? I am not changed towards you. She shook her head. Am I? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so, until in good season we could improve our worldly fortune by our patient industry. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy, he said impatiently. Your own feelings tell you that you are not what you are, she returned. I am That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fought with misery now that we are two. How often and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it and I can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words? No, never. In what then? In a changed nature, in an altered spirit, in another atmosphere of life, another hope as its great end, in everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this had never been between us, said the girl, looking mildly, but with steadiness upon him, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? Oh, no. He seemed to yield to the justice of this supposition in spite of himself, but he said with a struggle, You think not? 
I would gladly think otherwise if I could, she answered. Heaven knows. When I have learned a truth like this, I know how strong and irresistible it must be. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl, you who, in your very confidence with her, weigh everything by gain, or choosing her, if for a moment you were false enough to your one guiding principle to do so, do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do, and I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. He was about to speak, but with her head turned from him, she resumed. You may. The memory of what is past half makes me hope you will have pain in this. A very, very brief time, and you will dismiss the recollection of it gladly as an unprofitable dream from which it happened well that you awoke. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. She left him and they parted. Spirit, said Scrooge, show me no more, conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? One shadow more exclaimed the ghost. No more, cried Scrooge, no more, I don't wish to see it, show me no more. But the relentless ghost pinioned him in both his arms and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in another scene, a place, a room, not very large or handsome, but full of comfort. Near the winter fire sat a beautiful young girl, so like that last that Scrooge believed it was the same until he saw her, now a comely matron, sitting opposite her daughter. The noise in this room was perfectly tumultuous, for there were more children there than Scrooge in his agitated state of mind could count, and unlike the, the celebrated herd of the poem, they were not forty children conducting themselves like one, but every child was conducting it, itself like forty. The consequences were abhorious beyond belief, but no one seemed to care. On the contrary, the mother and the daughter laughed heartily and enjoyed it very much, and the latter, soon beginning to mingle in the sport, got pillaged by the young brigades most ruthlessly. What would I not have given to be one of them, though I never could have been so rude? No, no, I wouldn't for the wealth of the world have crushed that braided hair and torn it down, and for the precious little shoe I wouldn't have plucked it off. God bless my soul to save my life. As to measuring her waist in sport, as they did bold young brood, I couldn't have done it. I should have expected my arm to have grown round it for a punishment and never come straight again. And yet I should have dearly liked I own to have touched her lips, to have questioned her that she might have opened them, to have looked upon the lashes of her downcast eyes and never raised a blush, to have let loose waves of hair, an inch of which would be a keepsake beyond price. In short, I should have liked I do confess to have had the lightest license of a child and yet to have been a man enough to know its value. But now the knocking at the door was heard and such a rush immediately ensued that she was laughing face and, and plundered dress was borne towards it the center of the flushed and boisterous group which in time to greet the father who came home attended by a man laden with Christmas toys and presents, 
then sh shouting and struggling on the onslaught that was made on the defenseless porter, the scalding him with chairs for ladders to dive into his pockets, despoil him of, of brown paper parcels, hold on tight by his cravat, hug him round his neck, pummel his back, and kick his legs in irrepressible affection, the shouts of wonder and delight of which the, the development of every package was received. The terrible announcement that the baby had been taken in the act of putting a doll's frying pan into its mouth and was more than suspected of having swallowed a fictitious turkey glued on a wooden platter. The immense relief of finding this a false alarm, the joy, the gratitude, and the ecstasy. Oh, they, they were all indescribably alike. It is enough that by degree the children and their emotions got out of the parlor, and by one stair at a time up to the top of the house, there they went to bed and so subsided. And now Scrooge looked on more attentively than ever. When the master of the house, having his daughter leaning fondly on him, sat down with her and her mother at his own fireside, and when he thought that such another creature, quite as graceful and as full of promise, might have called him father and been a springtime in the haggard winter of his life. His sight grew very dim indeed. Belle, said the husband, turning to the wife with a smile, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Who was it? Guess. Well, how can I talk? Uh, don't I know, she added in the same breath, laughing as he laughed, Mr. Scrooge, Mr. Scrooge, it was. I passed his office window, and as it was not shut up, he had a candle inside. I could scarcely help seeing him. His partner lies upon a point of death, I hear, and there he sat alone, quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit said Scrooge with a broken voice, remove me from this place. I told you these shadows of these things that have been, said the ghost, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me, Scrooge exclaimed. I cannot bear it. He turned upon the ghost and seeing that it looked upon him with a face in which in some strange way there were fragments of all the faces it had shown him, wrestling with it. Leave me, take me back, haunt me no longer. In the struggle, if you could be called a struggle, in which the ghost, with no visible resistance on its part, was undisturbed by any effort of adversary, Scrooge observed that its light and burning high and bright and dimly connecting that with its influence over him, he seized the extinguisher cap and by a sudden action pressed it down upon his head. The spirit dropped beneath it so that the extinguisher covered its whole form. But though Scrooge pressed it down with all his force, he could not hide the light which streamed from under it in an unbroken flood upon the ground. He was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and further of being in his own bedroom, he gave the cap a parting squeeze in which his hand relaxed and had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. Awaking in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore and sitting up in bed to Get his thoughts together. Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was again upon the stroke of one. He felt that he was restored to consciousness in right nick of time for the special purpose of holding a, a conference with the second messenger dispatched to him through Jacob Marley's intervention. But finding that he turned uncomfortably cold when he began to wonder which of his curtains this new specter would draw back. He put them every one aside with his own hands and laying down again, established a sharp lookout all round the bed 
for he wished to challenge the spirit on the moment of his appearance and did not wish to be taken by surprise and made nervous. I mean, gentlemen of the free and easy sort who plume themselves on being acquainted with a move or two and being unusually equal to the time of day express the wide range of capacity for adventure by observing that they are good for anything from pitch and toss to manslaughter between which opposite extremes no doubt there lies a tolerably wide and comprehensive range of subjects without venturing for scrooge quite as heartily as this i don't mind calling on you to believe that he was ready for a good broad field of strange appearances and nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much now being prepared for almost anything he was not by any means prepared for nothing and consequently when the bell struck one and no shape appeared he was taken with a violent fit of trembling five minutes ten minutes a quarter of an hour went by yet nothing came all this time he lay upon his bed the very core and center of the blaze of ruddy light which streamed upon it when the clock proclaimed the hour and which being only light it was more alarming than a dozen ghosts as he was powerless to make out what it meant or would be at and was sometimes apprehensive that he might be at the very moment an interesting case of spontaneous combustion without having any consolation of knowing it at last however he began to think as you or i would have thought of first for it is always the person not in the predicament who knows what ought to have been done in it and would unquestionably have done it too at last i say he began to think that the source and secret of this ghostly light might be in the adjoining room from hence on further tracing it it seems to shine this idea taking full pos possession of his mind he got up softly and shuffled into his slippers to the door the moment scrooge's hand was on the lock a strange voice called him by his name and bade him to enter he obeyed it was his own room there was no doubt about that but it had undergone a surprising transformation the walls and ceilings were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened the crisp leaves of holly mistletoe and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as the dull petrification of of a hearth had never known in scrooge's time or molly's or for many and many a winter season gone heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne with turkeys geese game poultry brawn great joints of meat suckling pigs long wreaths of sausage mince pies plum puddings barrels of oysters red hot chestnuts cherry cheeked apples juicy oranges luscious pears immense twelfth cakes and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with the delicious steam in easy state upon this couch sat a jolly giant glorious to see who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike plenty's horn and held it up high up to shed its light on scrooge as he came peeping round the door come in exclaimed the ghost come in and know me better man scrooge entered timidly and hung his head before the spirit he was not the dogged scrooge he had been and though the spirit's eyes were clear and kind he did not like to meet them i am the ghost of christmas present said the spirit look upon me 
Scrooge irreverently did so. He was clothed in one simple green robe or mantle, bordered with white fur. This garment hung so loosely on figure that its capacious breast was bare, as if disdaining would be warded or concealed by any artifice. Its feet, observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, were also bare, and on its head it wore no other covering than a holy wreath set here and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eye, its open hand, its cherry voice, its unconstrained demeanor and its joyful air girded around its middle was an antique scabbard. But no sword was in it, and the ancient sheath was eaten up with rust. The Twelve Days of Christmas Carol is a Sherman Players production. Links by Barbara Bock. Recorded by Gary Blue and produced by Matt Austin and Steve Scott. If you enjoyed this production and would like to support us, please consider making a tax-deductible donation on our website, shermanplayers.org. Thank you.